Sisters and brothers, ladies and gentlemen, friends, neighbors, comrades, all citizens of the world, wherever you're going, wherever you've been, and wherever you're at, we welcome you to the Live from the Heartland show here on YouTube. New episodes air every Friday at 9 a.m. Central Time with individual interviews posted throughout the following week. I'm your host, Michael James, encouraging you to take the chain from the brain to get back in the people's game, because it's time to move from the lower level to the higher, from the shallower to the deeper, from the one-sided to the many, and from the abstract to the concrete. So without further ado, let's get it on. Welcome, you citizens of the world. I'm Michael James. I'm back home in Chicago's 49th Ward. And I'm here bringing you another edition of the Live from the Heartland show. This one is for the week of April 6th, and we are recording it on Monday, April 1st. I've got three guests today. Paul Drouse, an original member of the Live from the Heartland team, a noted sociologist and an activist up there in Michigan. He'll be joining us with a little political analysis and sharing of his activities then we're going to have T.J. Jamraz, the filmmaker on the film Murals. And we're going to end up the show with Adam James, our sports analyst. A little bit of things that have caught my attention. The Pope has called for a ceasefire in Gaza. I repeat, the Pope has called for a ceasefire in Gaza. Also, Netanyahu is banning Al Jazeera. Al Jazeera is a great source of news about what's going on, not only in the Middle East, but around the world. Check it out. We used to do in the show on a regular way a reefer report, and I do have a reefer report today. Years ago, a fellow named Dana Beal was a guest on our show. He was in Chicago. He's a longtime pioneer of activism around a legalization of marijuana. And at the age of 77, he is still active trying to bring ibogaine to Ukrainian soldiers on suffering from the battlefield trauma. Right now, he is locked up or out on bail in Idaho. Uh, he likes to supply people in New York on limited and fixed incomes with legal marijuana. And it's too expensive. He goes for the illegal. He was bringing 56 pounds of marijuana across the country. His car broke down in Idaho. A friendly cop stopped by, smelled the weed, and Dana Beal's plan is to stick around in Idaho and to help bring about legalization of marijuana in that state. He's a good guy, a legalization pioneer. Check in on him. The article I got the information from is from a recent New York Times, and you can find it. Dana Beal is his name. In a move to protect whales, Polynesian indigenous groups have decided to give them personhood. Indigenous leaders of New Zealand, Tahiti, and the Cook Islands signed an historic agreement recognizing whales as legal persons in a move conservationists believe will apply pressure to national governments to offer greater protection for these large mammals. A quote from an organizer, Mary Takoko, a Maori conservationist leading the Hini Moana Halo Ocean Initiative, says it's fitting that the traditional guardians are initiating this. For us, by restoring those world populations, we also restore our communities. That's from the news I get called Spark of Genius. Moving right along, a number of progressives are touted in the Washington Post as having been correct on Gaza all along. Now they could lose their seats. Some of the best members of Congress could be ousted this year, facing huge spending campaigns against them. This is by the Israel Public Affairs Committee, APAC, and they are recruiting and giving millions of dollars to more moderate Democrats. Be aware of this. Stick with our people, people who have been progressive all along, and we need them more than ever. On the labor front, the United Auto Workers election at the VW plant in Chattanooga is set to take place on April 17th. And for those of you who watched Oppenheimer, Cillian Murphy, the lead actor, is to star in a Miners for Democracy biopic. The movie is called Blood Runs Coal, The Yablonsky Murders and the Battle for the United Mine Workers of America. 
It's based on the 2020 nonfiction book by Mark Bradley, chronicles the 1969 murders of Joseph A. Yablonski, his wife and daughter. Yablonski had campaigned to replace Tony Boyle, the corrupt leader of the United Mine Workers of America. Yablonski supported better working conditions for union members and other reforms. I did meet his son, Chip, who's been involved with this movie. And it was a very sorry state of affairs back then. And hopefully this movie will get some attention on it and bring about more democracy in not only the United Mine Workers, but throughout. Um, Okay, we're going to be right back with our first guest, founding member of the Live from the Heartland team, the one and only Paul Drouse. Stay tuned, and we will be right back. Welcome back, all you citizens of the world, to Live from the Heartland for the week of April 6th. It gives me a lot of pleasure to bring on our next guest. He was an original member of the Live from the Heartland team when we did the show from the stage at the storied Heartland Cafe. Uh, he went on to write a book after he got his PhD about tuberculosis, and he is one guy who knows an awful lot these days about Detroit about green infrastructure, restorative justice, substance use and abuse, urban neighborhoods. He spends a lot of time in alleys by his own account. And one and only Paul Drouss. Good afternoon to you, Paul. Hey, Mike. Great to see you. Been a while. I haven't seen you since we were up there in Detroit following my kids' band, Twin Peaks, around years back. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. And I think I did the show one time down at Loyola. Downtown, yeah. Well, Downtown, you can yeah. be a host and you can come on the show anytime you want. All right, all right. I'll think well, about that. A reason I originally contacted you most recently was because there was a lot of talk about the Palestinian vote in mm -hmm. Detroit during the Democratic primary, and people really PO'd about uh, Biden's initial stance with uh, Israel attacking Gaza over and over. So I want to get your take on the Palestinian vote, but also just Michigan, what's happening politically. You know, you've got a couple of Democratic senators, got a Democratic governor. Uh, they still say it's a battleground state. I would hope not. You've got the UAW up there doing a lot of good work. Talk to us, Paul. So, um, yeah, I mean, Michigan, there's a lot going on. It's it's a mixed it's a mixed bag. You know, they sometimes say that there's southeast Michigan and the rest is Mississippi. Mm. <laughs> we got that in Illinois too. <laughs> yeah, but it's it's not quite that stark, but um the uh the issue around I live in Dearborn, right? I live in Dearborn, Michigan, which is sort of like the home and the heart of Arab America. And so we have about half our population or a little more than half. I guess it depends on, you know, on on which count, you know, you look at is Middle Eastern or Middle Eastern descent, right? Most of them are Muslim. Not all, not all the um, Arab Americans or Middle Eastern people here are Muslim. We have a fair number of Christian, Catholic, Middle Eastern people, and so on. But it's 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 definitely a center of uh, culture and communities uh, from that region. There's a lot of different reasons for why Dearborn is the center of kind of Arab American and Muslim life here. A lot of it has to do with Henry Ford, who you know, brought all these workers to Dearborn when he moved the plant from, you know, Detroit and Highland Park out to Dearborn, which was like farmland at that time, or just a small town and a lot of farmland. But 
a lot of those groups followed him out here and then they you know communities built up around around these uh, original sort of worker communities but as a result of that uh most of those original groups were uh from what's now Lebanon it was it, it was called Syria at the time i think in the 19th century um but over the years it's become a a a a, a destination point for lots of people coming from the arab speaking world and so that's included iraqis palestinians you know um other groups uh, yemeni we have a large yemeni population as well it's probably the second biggest after the lebanese population is the yemeni population and then we have a bunch of other groups and palestinians are amongst them now i mean with palestinians though i mean there are a lot of Palestinians living in Jordan and Lebanon also. So you have people that are Paris, Palestinian origin that may have migrated here from Lebanon or from Jordan, right? And so even for the people here that are not themselves Palestinian, I think what's going on in Gaza has been, you know, very um, traumatic um, because just the intensity of this onslaught, you know, starting shortly after October 7th. And so... I think the political result of that has been, you know, a measurable, you know, uh, dip in the support for uh, the Democratic uh, Party and Joe Biden in particular. <laughs> I think Michigan is still kind of a toss up. If you go look at the statewide polls and we have a strong Democratic governor, we actually have two houses that are both run uh, majority Democratic at this point, the, the, the Senate and the House, which is. Uh, for, for the first time in decades that that's been the case. And so it's it's kind of a, you know, a paradox, I guess, that the, the state is, 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 is sort of strongly democratic at one level, but another level, it's basically a coin flip as far as the presidential race goes. And a lot of that, a lot of that um, does have to do with Southeast Michigan and probably, you know, that the, because the Muslim American, Arab American vote is a, is a, concentrated voting block here they do have the capacity to tip an election on the margins but a lot of it is also some you know thing issues with with president biden too in terms of i you know age and so on i yeah. think that i i'd like to believe that people will come around and see that the danger of not having the democrats win this time uh we'll see and i just wanted to throw in there that i think cook county uh, has the largest concentration of Palestinians in the whole country. Yeah, they, they may. I mean, I mean, Palestinians are not like a huge group here, but they are definitely Palestinians here. I'm not sure how big a, a group is. My my son has my son grew up here, so he has very good friends who are Palestinian, Yemeni, you know, Lebanese, sort of, you know, the whole range. Um, I think I think people will come around i think they'll be more likely to come around if biden comes around and we're open we're working on it and, I, and so i'm I, I see you know we're seeing the signs of that i mean i don't know i mean some people are not coming back they're not going to vote for trump but they're not going to come back right to biden but you know i mean biden's got a lot to worry about as far as losing other votes if he if he you know caters to one vote i mean that's the problem with the democratic party right so but I mean, I, I think the fact that there's increasing pressure, the U.S. finally, finally uh, did not veto a ceasefire resolution at the U.N., which is a significant thing, if you follow that. Yeah, um, no, it was great. Uh, I don't, it doesn't mean much yet, but I mean that. And then today I heard that there's uh, huge, huge protests against Netanyahu in Israel. There are. And, uh, you know, and uh, also the Pope came out for ceasefire and... Uh, Netanyahu also banned Al Jazeera. We talked about that at the opening. Um, okay. And one of the things that we've had here in Chicago and Chicago land is uh -huh. ongoing demonstrations on pro-Palestinian, you know, ceasefire, all that. And they've been everywhere. They've been in city councils. They followed uh, Jan Schakowsky, our congresswoman, who's gotten to be pretty good on the issue. Uh, yeah. There's a lot of activity uh, by pal pro Palestinian groups going on around here. Yeah, I mean we we have them too, obviously, because we have a big population here. But you know, <laughs> and the University of Michigan has been a big has been a big target as well. And so the, our president at the University of Michigan, because I work for the University of Michigan, of course, 
Uh, recently, um, he got very upset because there was a disruption at an honors convocation, and he wanted to issue a new policy. So he's trying to get faculty to approve this policy. I don't know how likely that's going to be because I think faculty like myself feel like, you know, nobody, you know, if it's your kid that's a, it's their honors graduation or whatever, you probably don't like to be disrupted. But on the other hand, you know, if people sit and protest, you know, quietly outside in a corner, you know, <laughs> that doesn't always get the attention or the results that you want to have. So, I mean, you know, protesters are going to disrupt when there's something they they really care about. I mean, I think the university does, there are issues around how far you go in terms of support for Palestine, because of course it's, it's a politically charged issue all the way down. And, you know, some of the, you know, some of the left responses, I think, um, you know, have been a little bit light on thinking about October 7th. I mean, in my view, like, you know, treating it as basically a straightforward outcome of the occupation, which in my view, there's no doubt that it's an outcome of the occupation, but I, I don't think you can dismiss the decisions that were made by, by you know, the uh, folks that engaged in that across the border attack on civilians and, and, and young people and so on. So that is, that is tricky. Uh, it's a tricky issue for academics, for teachers, for everybody. But I mean, I mean, we do need to confront the situation. And so yeah, it's no, taken too long. It's taken way too long. And, and hopefully there's there's gonna be movement on it soon. That's what, what I'm gonna say. Well, we'll be we'll be on top of this one uh weekly probably for a while. Yeah. Let me ask you a little bit about uh you recently took off and uh you uh you had a Fulbright scholarship. Uh mm -hmm. tell us about getting a Fulbright and where it took you. So I got a Fulbright Scholar Award to go spend four months in uh, Lithuania, which is a small country in Eastern Europe, one of the Baltic states, you know, formerly a part of the um, uh, Soviet Union, actually. And so I've, I've been going to Lithuania f off and on for the past like 10 years. I, I, I went there the first time is almost like a fluke that I got invited to go speak there uh, because I had a colleague that was Lithuanian and, and she passed my name on to somebody at a university there. And that's kind of how it started. But then I ended up going back a few times and meeting more people each time I went. So I got really interested in some of the things that are going on around sort of urban, urban regeneration and some of these local fights over urban redevelopment, you know, things that you would recognize from places like Detroit or Chicago. And I, I got to know some of the groups that were involved in really creative types of protest and resistance, but also urban redevelopment visioning types of efforts. So I was able to go over there and spend basically four months kind of hanging around with them. And uh, I was participating in this opera that they created about their history of their neighborhood. They created this community opera that was pretty cool. And Were you singing? I was like singing in the chorus, you know. Uh, <laughs> but they just handed me you know, like a sheet of lyrics in Lithuanian. You know, and I was, you know, I didn't know what I was saying. I mean, I, it did help me to learn a little bit more Lithuanian, but. And they'd say, yeah, if you're going to come and hang out here, then, you know, you need to participate. So they had me singing in the chorus and stuff like that. So that was pretty fun. And they they feed you really well. You know, when they do social stuff, you know, they always, you know, they always eat and they have a good time. It's a really great group of people. And then I spent two months in Poland teaching a class in Poland. So um, this was actually... You know, this was in uh, last year, the first six months of last year. So the invasion of of Ukraine still was fairly recent, and that was kind of the big, you know, oh, you know, overshadowing issue in both those places because you know the Lithuanians, you know, for them this is this is this is not an abstract fear, you know, of uh, Russian invasion. You know, no, for real. And I mean, going back to the Israel uh, Palestine issue, that um, this is one of my other. I'm not pro-war, as you know, but I have been in favor of the support of the Ukrainians in their resistance to the to the Russian army, and I, I feel like that. Uh, unfortunately, the one is getting counterposed to the other sometimes. That you know, you support Ukraine, but you don't support Palestine, and I feel like they're both, in a sense, they should be lined up as opposed to opposed struggles. But um, right. 
But when I was over there, I mean, I really got an appreciation for, you know, that history. Uh, but also, you know, there are people that weren't going to, like, live their lives in fear either, you know. So they're basically pretty resolved to, you know, if 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 Putin comes or if the Russians come, then, you know, we're, we're going to fight. Like, just like the Ukrainians are fighting and we're going to support the Ukrainians. And, and, um, and we hope you Americans don't get weak knees, basically. Hey, Paul Drous, let me ask you a little bit about, you just were named, uh, you had to some position from the University of Michigan at Dearborn to the city of Detroit. What is that mm -hmm. all about? So um, while I was in Lithuania, I was actually approached by someone at the University of Michigan, um, you know, electronically, of course, and they in invited me to apply to be the faculty director at the University of Michigan Detroit Center, which is... Uh, a sort of a, a workshop event space that the University of Michigan has downtown Detroit or midtown Detroit, actually on Woodward Avenue, right right across the street from where we were the last time when we met up, I think at, at uh, Majestic Bar, one of those places. <laughs> and um, so the space has been there, you know, almost 20 years, almost about the same amount of time that I've been here in, in Michigan. And uh, it, it really it took me by surprise, but they asked me if I was interested and I was like, well, yeah, sure. Of course. You know, so I kind of gave them my materials and then they ended up naming me faculty director. So I started in, in the end of June when I got back and it's been a lot of fun. You know, I do a lot, I get to do like a lot of um, events, a lot of like uh, community engagement, a lot of networking, you know, um, it, it gives me a reason to just like, it's sort of like being the producer of the heartland. It gives me just an excuse to, call people on the phone or send people an email saying, Hey, I heard you're doing something uh, pretty cool. Would you want to come down here and talk about it here? You know, like that kind of thing. In a way you prepared me for this, uh, for this role. Well, if you had known any people to, that would be good on the show, keep sending them my way. Okay. Let me ask you, uh, let me ask you a little bit in some of the, uh, the promo I read about you. Uh, it says lately I have been spending a lot of time in alleys. What's that about? I, I mean, I've always been running through alleys, love alleys and stuff. Yeah, so, you know, alleys, as Nelson Algren once said, you have to love a city not for its, just for its its show, its ballets and its theaters, but for its alleys too, right? <laughs> and um, so I got, I'm, I met a guy here because I go to a lot of different community meetings. I meet interesting people. I met this young guy who was doing this alley activation work and he started in his own community. It's basically, the, the alleys here in Detroit is different than Chicago, I mean. They're like little jungles. You know, a lot of them are sort of like they've been neglected so long. They're overgrown. There's foliage in there. There's people have dumped stuff in there. And so um, it's been like this sort of like uh, um, terra incognita for a while. <laughs> but some different communities, people have started kind of taking the alleys back and doing these really interesting. They've got all these ideas about how they want to re revitalize these alleys. So I got involved with some of these communities doing this work. And it's just led like one thing has led to another thing. So now we're doing what we call urban acupuncture in alleys, right, which is sort of this hyper local uh, urban revitalization approach to tie, kind of doing really, really small pinpricks of change in different communities that help sort of ripple out into the broader uh, environment. And that's been really fun because it's got me involved with a lot of these local groups that are kind of off the grid, but doing really, really great stuff. And Detroit is you know, full of people like that. I mean, just like Chicago, like you could walk, you know, go through any neighborhood and there are people you would never know about, right? Um, but they're out there doing this work like day in and day out trying to, you know, recover their neighborhoods and following the alleys just led me, you know, you know, into all these other things too. So well, one of the other things I've noticed from uh, on our social media is that you've been doing a lot of uh, sketches and artwork. Uh, is that a therapy thing? Is that something you always did? Is that new? Tell me oh. about your artwork. So, you know, I always drew when I was a, when I was a kid, I used to draw all the time. And then even in college, I was a, I was an art minor, actually, as an undergraduate. Um, but then as I got further on, like in my career, I, I kind of got away from it. I would still draw like on occasion or, or I, I have a notebook. I'd, t I'd take I keep a journal and sometimes sketch in there. But then at some point, I think it was either right before the pandemic or it, it definitely in the pandemic, I got, it became like a ritual thing. Like, I guess it was therapeutic. Like every night I would try and do like a new drawing or a new sketch. So, and then I started putting them on, on Instagram and on Facebook because I would do them in the iPad. Sometimes I do them in a, in a sketch pad and I take a photo, but so, a lot of times I just do them on the iPad and then I just share them. 
And it became just a way, you know, for me to like process things I was seeing, or if I saw something interesting that day, or like an interesting character or scene or whatever. A lot of them are plants and, you know, like weeds. Like I got really into weeds for a while. I was drawing all these pictures of weeds and, and a lot of them were alley based things and stuff like that. So I, I think it's going to lead, you know, to me, I'm thinking about doing more sort of like writing, drawing style publication, you know, like publications that incorporate. In fact, I have a book that's supposed to come out uh, hopefully next year, which uses my drawings in the book. So I'll definitely keep you posted. What's what's the book on? Uh, it's it's all about this guy that I know here in Detroit who's a metal artist uh, who grew up in uh, Germany. His father was a, a black GI and his mother was a German woman. He was born in Germany and then moved to Detroit in the 80s. And he'd stayed here ever since. And he makes these windmills out of um, metal. He's, he's a fine metal you know, craftsman, but then he started doing these other projects during the Great Recession, these sort of upcycling metal projects building windmills out of like uh, using uh satellite dishes for the windmill blades and all this kind of stuff and so i got to know him i got to know him and then just started i did a few projects with him in his life he's just such an interesting fascinating character i just kind of started writing this book manuscript with him and, and it, well we're going to look forward to the book and we're going to look forward to you coming back on the show and uh, hopefully i get to see you in the flesh so to speak uh sooner or later Paul Drouse, Absolutely. it's been great having you on the show. And uh, everybody else, stay tuned here on the left end of your dial. We'll be right back with more Live from the Heartland. Can I say it? Over and out. Brad, yeah, but you're the first guest, so. Okay, well, I'm over and out. Okay. Over and out for this segment. All right. I'm just a poor. Traveling through this world below, there is no sickness, no toil, no danger in that bright land to which I go. I'm Uh, welcome back to Live from the Heartland for the week of uh, April 6th. And once again, I'm Michael James. And I've always been a fan of uh, the work of the Works Projects Administration in the 30s. I love murals that I've seen in various post offices. My favorite mural, I got to say, is John Brown out in Wichita, Kansas. Um, and uh, our music producer, Lynn Orman, hipped me to a fellow named T.G. Jamraz, and he is a filmmaker, an actor, a photographer, a writer, uh, a creator in many forms. And he has a new movie out, and it is about um, the Uptown Post Office and the murals in that post office. So without any more uh, jabber on my part, let's bring him on. Hello to you. Hello, hello. You? Thanks for having me. Glad Thank you for having me. Tell me a little bit about how this movie came to be. My understanding is you were standing in line at a post office in Uptown and something hit you. Well, have you ever been to the Uptown post office? I have, but it's been a long time. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people, you know, they don't look up when they're there and they don't realize <laughs> the beautiful artwork that's there. And some of the people who work there don't even realize it. And what it is, is that that post office in Uptown um, was built in the 1930s. And it was built through the New Deal uh, program uh, that was through the Justice Department. It was pre-WPA. It was like the program oh. that they established. What they did was they set aside 1% of the budget of the building for artwork. And so they would have contests for artists. And I was up there one time standing there surprisingly in a long line at Christmas. And I kind of just looked up and I said, oh, my God, what are these? And two years later, I found myself standing in the living room of the uh, artist's son, the 90-year-old artist's son in New York City. So I always say, be careful when you ask questions because it takes you down rabbit holes and you find yourself doing things. Um, 
so it was it, i found myself just kind of um interested in the beautiful murals but i was like who are in these who are these people represented and the artist's name was henry barnum poor he was a new york artist who was one of the greatest artists of the 20th century nobody really knows about he was a contemporary of hopper his house that he built is about eight miles from where hopper's house is and he put Carl Sandburg in the left one and Louis Sullivan in the right one. So if you go in there, you're like, oh, that's Carl Sandburg, I think. And then you find out, yeah, it is. But why is he holding a guitar? Okay. So these are some of the questions that I started with, like, who are the people? What are they? And it took me on a, a journey where I traveled around and worked on it for seven years in between other projects I was working on. That's uh, great. And so the name of the film is what? The name of the film is called The Murals, and I have a CD here, the soundtrack. It's called The Murals, and what it is, it's basically a documentary about the Uptown Post Office murals, who made them, why they were made, and why the three artists kind of connect. It's not a biography of each of them, because that would take a long time, but I kind of wanted to understand why Henry Varnaport chose these two artists to represent Chicago and re represent his ideals. What I found along the way is that Louis Sullivan and Carl Sandburg and Henry Varnum Poor, the, the, their artistic mission was very similar. They were prolific artists who pop, popped out a lot of stuff. We all know Carl Sandburg did everything, right? He wrote poetry, reviewed films, you know, he did lots of things. But I he didn't also, know he was a, played the guitar. I well, didn't here's know. the funny thing he would play the guitar. And at the end of his poetry readings, when he went on the road, he'd say, well, you can sit around and listen to me play guitar. I would have done it anyway. If you want to leave, feel free to leave. And he collected this book called The American Songbag. So what he did, this is one of his projects. And he worked on it for several years. What he did when he rode around and went, rode on the trains, he met all these people. He collected all these songs of America. So they're all Americana, uh, you know, songs. 1800s, 1900s. And what's interesting about the book is he would play the songs. And then a young, uh, you know, Pete Seeger, a young Woody Guthrie picked this book up and learned these songs. And then Bob Dylan picked it up and learned them. In fact, Bob Dylan has a story where he went to Carl Sandburg's house unannounced to tell him he was a poet as well. And um, to play him and, you know, to, to tell him he was influenced by it. And up to people like Wilco today. So, what I decided to do was kind of focus on the Carl Sandburg portion of the film about being a musician because nobody, nobody knew about it. So I went down to Galesburg. Where I talked to some historians, which is in the film, The Murals, which is actually screening next week at Loyola, April 11th at 6 p.m. It's free. I was getting there. <laughs> yeah. And so what's interesting, we had the, uh, I had some people from the Old Town School Folk Music record some of the songs in the soundtrack. I had some people I was working with. I recorded a couple songs. So you can stream the soundtrack, the murals on Spotify. Um, you can hear the songs in the soundtrack to the film, the murals. And so what I did is I focused on that. Louis Sullivan, um, I focused on a bit of his theory of being an artist. In the murals themselves at the post office, Louis Sullivan's holding a model of a building. It's the Carson Peary Scott building. Okay which is now the target <laughs> on State Street, right? You know this, of course. <laughs> so tar the Target Corporation bought it and restored the building beautifully. Well, that was one of um, his, you know, his uh, highest achievements, the Carson Peary Scott building, the way it was designed. So he's holding that building. And I'm like, well, it's a target now. Wow. So what I did on some research, if you go on the TikTok, because I know that your viewers are all on TikTok, um, if you search goth target, that target comes up with over a million hits because young people have adopted it and call it goth target. And they have no idea. Probably Louis Sullivan designed it, but it's, um, it's something that's very relevant today. So I kept finding these reasons why, oh my God, all this stuff is still relevant. These artists have been gone for a long time. People are, you know, people are obsessed with Sullivan, his designs. People are obsessed with Sandberg, his poetry and Henry Varnum Poor as well. So I just found that all the artists really kind of spoke to me because, um, you know, they were... What's interesting about all the artists is that they were real true American artists. 
and they believed in democracy and they believed in the American worker. And they, you know, people accuse them of being communists because they believed in the American worker. And we know that Carl Sandburg wrote about the common people all the time. Um, and you would be surprised at how much Louis Sullivan wrote about democracy. A lot of people don't know that. Um, in his biography, he wrote a lot about the importance of, you know, the work you do, who you are, having honor and everything you do. And, and so I really found it interesting. The government paid artists to make art at one point. Crazy, right? Hopefully that'll come back. You say it took seven years. Did yes. you have a lot of help? Did you have to raise money? Did you do it on your own? Give fill us in. I know you got a lot of musical support. Well, what happened is um, somebody asked me that question at, at a screening. They said to me, I go into the post office and I mail my stuff and leave. And I say, oh, that's a nice mural. What caused you to stay working on it for so long? And Carl Sandburg once said projects just walked up to him. And this project walked up to me like there was a story to tell. Uh, yeah, I mean, I worked odd jobs, you know. I was telling, I, I remember one weekend I had to get the sound work done and I was doing some work at Soldier Field for a Bears games to pay for the sound work. So, you know, sometimes you do whatever you have to. Right. On. Um, but I found along the way that people donated their time. I interviewed some experts about Henry Varnum Poor. They wanted to tell the story, you know, uh, the Galesburg, uh, Sandberg historian, the people at the Cliff Dwellers Club downtown here in Chicago, where Louis Sullivan had an honorary membership. Um, they all wanted to, to tell the stories. So they donated their time. And I had a few people help me with sound and camera occasionally and that type of thing. But, um, you know, it was a kind of a labor of, uh, I wouldn't say labor of love, but just a labor of, you know, I, I just thought it had to be, the story should be told, you know. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing it. I don't know if I'll get over to Loyola on the 11th at 6 o'clock at 1032 West Sheridan, but sooner or later, I'm going to see this movie. I'm going to go back to that post office. Let me ask you how it was received. You showed the film in New York at uh, the Roca Museum. You had it at Old Town School of Folk Music. Yeah, I've had a few screenings. We screened at the Sandberg Historic Site last year, too. And, you know, the, the documentary is broken down into the story of Henry Varnum Poor a bit, a little bit about Sandberg, a little about Sullivan. So each screening kind of has a different focus. The people in the Old Town School of Folk Music, they loved all the music and the Sandberg stuff. I had interviewed Dan Zanes, who was a Grammy-winning artist, who had done some Sandberg songs, too, some of these American Songbag. But when I went to New York, I was really surprised because I went to where the house is. Henry Varnum Poor hand built a house called Crow House. And right now it's they have a petition out there. Um, they're trying to save it and make it a museum. OK. And we um, in Roca Museum was in Nyack and he helped found that museum. So the two screenings I had out there, people showed up that were. They were like, oh, my parents were friends with the Poors. And when I was a little kid, I ran around the house. It was like a family reunion at one place. And they were so emotional watching it because Peter Poor, the 92-year-old son, was telling stories. I was showing pictures of the house. And they're like, yep, that's just how I remember it. And they were all like, hey, your sister was my friend's, you know, your my friend's sister in second grade. You remember me? So it was this kind of crazy thing where I was here. And I tapped into some emotional thing that they were, you know, recounting the glory days of South Mountain Road, where everyone lived on Burgess Meredith, Maxwell Anderson, um, uh, John Hausman, uh, Ben Hecht, you know, it goes on and on, right? the names of people that were there. And so I kind of got into discovering, I started here on, you know, over here on uh, Broadway, and I end up on South Mountain Road in New York, talking about Kurt Vale and Lonnie Lettia. You know, and about how they came, you know, that they would hang out there. Mar Marcel Ducamp would hang out there. And so I'm talking to Peter Poor. And as an example, he says to me, hey, you want to see some family photos? And I said, sure. He's like, here's me as a kid. And here's my mom. Her, her, my mom's friend in the village took him. I said, oh, that's cool. What, what was his name? Um, Man Ray. And I went, what? So I basically saw pictures Man Ray took that nobody has ever seen because they're family photos. So, you know, along the way, I just, these names that kept dropping, I was like, these are like the big names of the 20th century, you know? And a lot of people forget about it. 
And I think it's important because um, I just think there was a time those people who ran the the uh, the government at the time and during the war, they knew that it was important, that art was important. The old Churchill quote, you know, they say cut the art programs. And he says, um, you know, why should we, why should we pay for art programs? And Churchill says, well, if we cut the art programs, what are we fighting for? Well, let's hope we get a lot of art programs down the line as we have a tsunami of democracy in this country. I look forward to meeting you in person. Uh, a reminder to everybody that on April 11th, the uh, the murals film will show at uh, Loyola University at 1032 Sheridan. And uh, next time we have you on, you could tell us about your work as an actor in The Dark Knight, some of the other projects <laughs> you're working on. And... Uh, it's really good to meet you, man, and I'm really glad that you've done this project. Yeah, it's good to meet you, too, and the Chicago flag behind me, that's my next project. Right on, brother, and everybody stay tuned. We'll be right back with a little bit more of Live from the Heartland. Welcome back to Live from the Heartland for April 6th. That's the week of April 6th. And now I bring on our great sports analyst, the one and only Adam James. He's becoming no stranger to our regular listeners. People seem to like the information you give us and your presentation and analysis. I say hallelujah. And, uh, you know, this guy is actually my cousin. He grew up in Hawaii, where I just went by his high school, out of which he was recruited by Dennis Green, came to Chicago, played football at Northwestern, and that's how we got close. So hello there, Cousin Adam. How are you doing today? I'm doing fantastic, or should I say aloha, Michael? I'm back. I do have a Rainbow Warriors t-shirt. Awesome. And, uh, our guest last week included Guy Benjamin, who played for the 49ers, who coached uh, the Rainbow Warriors at the University of Hawaii, as well as the one year there was an arena football team from Hawaii. He yes, also played behind Montana on the 49ers. Enough of the vacation talk. Uh, lots going on in sports. Give us a little bit of a hit of what you think people should know about and be paying attention to. Well, obviously, right off the bat, it's March Madness, or shall I say April awesomeness here. April now. <laughs> exactly. So March Madness is just so amazing. It just rolls right into the month of April. Uh, the men's college basketball has been great. But, you know, it's really stood out to me is this women's basketball, um, you know, just how it's evolved and grown over the years. I remember it was about 15 years ago, there was a player named Ruth Riley at University of Notre Dame. And she was basically the shack of women's college basketball. She was absolutely amazing. I was um, drawn to watching her. And I remember saying to a couple of my friends who are big sports fans, I go, man, have you been watching the women's college basketball tournament? It's amazing. And of course, they made fun of me. But all these years later, uh, women's basketball has grown and grown and grown. The fan base has become so passionate, and it is just amazing to see. You know, another thing on that is if people pay attention to, like, women's volleyball. Which yes. Is, if volleyball is, you know, it's something a lot of us played. Um, we play basketball, too, a little bit. But uh, the, the women's volleyball has been great, too. Absolutely. And in Hawaii, women's uh, volleyball program, the Wahinis, are phenomenal. It's as big a sport and followed as closely as any other major sport, the football team, the basketball team. Women's volleyball is fantastic. So a lot of um, commendation to how the, the leaders of the sports programs have developed it, how they've worked so hard to create this amazing um, you know, network of passionate players and fans. So 
a lot of respect to them. You know, when this show comes out, we'll have already, these, some of these amazing games will have been played. So, but right now, as I'm sitting here being interviewed by, by you, there is an amazing matchup that's gonna happen later today between LSU and Iowa. And it is so exciting. And, and right now, I don't know who's gonna win. By the time this show is out, We'll already know the winner of that, and it'll be getting close to the championship game for women's basketball. I encourage everybody out there who loves really great athleticism and passionate play, check out the women's tournament. That'll be good. I will definitely be doing that. Uh, and you know, I do follow the Bulls pretty closely, who had a great win the other day over the Timberwolves. <laughs> now, let's, uh, one of the things that I'm not too happy about is the White Sox have lost three games by a run a piece, and uh, I don't know what's going on right now behind me. I turned the TV off to record the show, uh, but baseball season is back in swing, and there's some big news. And uh, you know, you've talked about Otani on the show before. What do you got to tell us about this uh, the betting scandal that apparently he knew nothing about? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so this is still unfolding, and as this show is being. Um, presented, there may be new developments. But as of right now, allow me to give a quick recap. Where What happened was there was a, um, a bookie in California who was being investigated by federal agents. And there was a writer who became aware that there was an account with the name Shohei Atani that had deposited large amounts of money into this bookie's account. So she got a hold of the interpreter. And when this conversation happened, the interpreter was with the Dodgers in Seoul, Korea, as they were getting ready to play the Padres in these opening games. The interpreter in the conversation, in the interview, for about 90 minutes, said that it was me, I did it, but Shohei took care of me. He take care, took care of all this. After their game, the Dodgers were pulled into a special meeting. They were told that this story is going to break. And the interpreter got up in front of the room. He apologized to everybody. He said, but Shohei took care of me. Now, during all this, Shohei was listening. He doesn't stand, understand everything in English, but he heard his name, and he heard large amounts of money. He asked for another interpreter. He quickly was telling people that there's something wrong here. And so now the interpreter is being investigated for um, possibly stealing money from Shohei Atani. But unfortunately for baseball and for anybody in law enforcement looking at the situation, there has to be a thorough investigation. Regardless of what Shohei is saying at this time, all we know are the facts. And the facts are that a bank account with his name deposited large amounts of money into a bookie's account. So they got to get to the bottom of it. I, I don't really believe that he's involved, but it's just an example of how as sports have grown to a mega business, people involved have to be very careful. The players, the coaches, uh, anybody around the game really needs to be aware. Well, it'll be interesting to see. I'm not so sure he didn't know more than he's saying. Correct. Uh, and, you know, I know that uh, not only has the IRS got an investigation going on, but also Major League Baseball. I mean, it would be a crushing blow to the sport and to certainly the Dodgers if he does get implicated. We definitely will keep everybody posted on that. Uh, yeah. You know, do you have any else other things on sports you'd like to share? Are you getting ready for the Olympics this summer? What's going on? Yes, indeed. Before we get too far off the topic of gambling, I just want to take a moment to recognize what happened to the coach of the Cavaliers, where he was um, contacted directly by a gambler, you know, complaining about how the team had played and how it had affected his gambling. So really, we have to make sure that we're being very cognizant of those, um, those aspects of, of the growing games of sports and how it affects others in the gambling world. So the Olympics are starting up in just a short while. It's going to be really exciting. I am very excited to see how Team USA does, but I'm also a passionate a fan of sports in general. I love watching all the all the athletes from various countries. Definitely rooting for the U.S. of A. But it's always great to see the interesting stories that come out of the Olympics. I sometimes root for the Cubans, and <laughs> but I do I do like love the USA team, and I, I do like like the international aspect of the whole thing. I like uh, world competition. Um, yes. Well, you know. Um, I don't know what about this gambling stuff. You know, when I watch any sports program now on my cable TV, it's, there's just gambling ad after gambling ad. And yes. I don't know how they keep all these things separate. You know, players are not allowed to gamble, certainly not on their own team. But, you know, the pressure and, uh, you know, people like to bet, make bets anyhow. You know, kids did it. We bet. I'll bet you you can't do this or I bet you can't do that. and uh, it's the, the gambling, uh, 
coming into sports in a big time way, I think will have a negative impact down the line or it'll make it more popular. Your thoughts? Yes, definitely more popular. And I do believe in freedom. I believe that the organizations should have the right to control some of these aspects. I, I believe that the government law enforcement has to be aware and watching out for illegal activities to protect consumers. But I, I'm okay with the process as long as there are guardrails to keep people safe. And certainly people who are uh, not of age should be kept from getting involved with that. Well, Adam James, uh, cousin Adam, it's always great to see you. I see you pretty regularly now. We do do a family Zoom every week. And that's kind of been fun. And uh, it was great to be in Hawaii to see where you played football over at Hunahou and uh, to go down there by the Outrigger Canoe Club and all those kind of things. We'll have you back on the show in the next week or two. So stay tuned, everybody, for Adam James. He gives us a good report. And for everyone else out there, let me just say it's time to wrap up this show. For this week, last week's show had Guy Benjamin, the former quarterback at the 49ers and Stanford, as well as Mike McGraw, a great guy, Michael Piranha McGraw, who comes out of Chicago. They both are on the island and they do a lot of good work out there. Next week, I've got our old pal Tom Clark coming on, as well as Koya Paz. And we want to thank Kev Moe and Chick Streetman for the intro and the outro on the music. And I want to thank Hal James, our engineer, I want to thank Katie Hogan, Lynn Orman, Tom Clark, our producers. Don't forget to get registered to vote. Don't forget to talk it up. We got a big election coming on. We do want a tsunami of turnout for the protection of democracy. And let's just say together, all power to the people, because together we can make it a reality. Do good in the world. The world needs all the good that you and I do together, that we all do over and out. We want to thank you for watching the Live from the Heartland show. New episodes air every Friday beginning at 9 a.m. Central Time. Episodes air each following Thursday on Can TV, 9 p.m. in Sweet Home Chicago on Channel 21 or streaming everywhere else at cantv.org. Audio episodes go live on WLUW each Saturday, 9 a.m. on the left end of your dial at 88.7 FM or streaming everywhere worldwide at WLUW.org. They're available on Apple and Spotify podcasts by looking up Live from the Heartland on either platform and are also broadcast on Lumpen Radio each Friday at 9 a.m. on 105.5 FM and streaming at LumpenRadio.com. I'm Michael James, and I'm glad to have been your host. Until next time, remember, do good in the world because the world needs all the good that you do, that I do, that we do together. All power to the people. Over and out. Gone to limb. Are you doing the best you can? Tell me, are you doing?